Welcome to Template Metaprogrammers Anonymous. <laughs> My name is John, and I'm a Template Metaprogrammer. <laughs> yeah, so um, actually, uh, yeah, we are going to definitely talk about template metaprogramming here, but uh, also we're going to talk about reflection, which is a kind of runtime metaprogramming. Um, so we're going to talk about both, and uh, so I guess I should just say first, uh, you know, we should just define metaprogramming. What does that mean? Um, you know, you can say it's like metaphysics, that should make it clear, but metaphysics is like physics is sort of, you know, the, the study about the subject. And so metaprogramming is sort of programming about programming. You're writing code that generates code or modifies code or, or is, you know, modifying the compiler in some way. Um, and then uh, reflection is runtime programming. And uh, that is sort of very specifically at runtime when you have code that can sort of look at and, and act on the structure of the code itself. And I wanted to show a couple examples of kind of what we're going to be working towards in this talk today. So um, here's a scenario. You might have some variables, and you might want to be able to uh, serialize them, binary and deserialize. And so to do that, you'd you know, write some functions. Uh, you, know, you could do it this way. You could do it by hand. And this would work. Or uh, you might want to do a like an ASCII, you know, a print to text, and then a, a way to read the text as well. And uh, you know, this will also work. Um, so we can just see this here. I'm going to uh, print this. Notice now it uh, said compiling down there. This is the uh, output of the program. Uh, occasionally throughout the talk, I'm going to compile the code, and it's going to appear down here. Okay, so uh, what we just did is we ran this print function, uh, which printed out our two variables. You can see that right there. So uh, if we want to add another variable, uh, we can do that, but it's kind of annoying because we need to add it to all these functions, to print, to parse, and we'd have to go back and add it to our serialize and deserialize. But we can see this does work. <coughs> if, however, we have reflection, uh, which sort of is a way of uh, viewing the structure of the code from within the code itself, we can write higher level algorithms. And what we could do is we can take all this print stuff, all these specific um, functions for dealing with our variables. And what we can do is we can just say, hey, reflection system, here are our variables. And then uh, we can write a, um, a print variables function, or if you're pretentious like me, you call it meta print variables. What this does is it can just act on the notion of variables and somehow uh, print them. And so uh, what we're going to see is I'm going to hit compile again, and uh, the exact same results come out here. So uh, somehow. There's a system which can just understand variables at a higher level and then and basically automatically write all that code that you just saw. And you know, if we add a new variable, then it also will you know, just get printed automatically. No need to manually write code. So that is uh, reflection on variables. And you can also do uh, reflection on functions. So here's an add and print function. It takes um, two integers, adds them, and you can see down here it, it prints them out here. So you know we added four and three, and that gets seven. Okay, and uh, what we might want to do is bind this to Lua. So uh, when you're going to use Lua, you got to include some Lua headers, add a Lua state, actually call the function in Lua. This is just basic stuff. Uh, and then in addition to that, you actually need to write a a binding function. And what this does is this function is going to sort of translate between C++ and Lua. I probably some of you guys have, have done this kind of thing. And then finally, you need to register that binding function with Lua. And at this point, we can actually, uh, down on this line uh, 21 here, call add and print in Lua. And you can see that works just fine. Uh, however, this is pretty annoying. I mean, if you know how to use Lua, it's annoying because it's just a bunch of boilerplate code. And if you don't know how to use Lua, you know, there's a, like a 100-page you know, document getting in your way before you can actually start writing this code. And so it would be nice if instead, you just had some sort of metabind function, uh, which used reflection and could understand um, functions at some higher level. And then uh, all you had to do was register the function with your system, and that could just somehow magically bind it to Lua. And now it's really easy. If you want to add a new function and you want to call it from your scripting language, you can just do that, simple as registering it, and you can see that works. Okay, so um, that's what we're going to 
talk about in uh, the, the lecture today. We're going to figure out how to implement those. We're going to use uh, template metaprogramming to get there. I should also point out that at that game company, we also um, do registration of class and member functions and member variables. Uh, there's not enough time to go over this um, stuff in the lecture, but uh, you know, hopefully with sort of the things I outlined today, you'd be able to figure this kind of stuff out, and it's very useful too. All right, so with that said, uh, let's move on to templates. Um, so this is probably a very familiar site uh, to most of you here. This is just how you use a template. This is STD Vector. Vector is a uh, resizable array. Of course, you've probably all seen this a bunch of times. Anyway, I'm just uh, pushing a bunch of numbers to the back of the array here, and now I'm going to print them out. And you can see, of course, uh, prints out one, two, three. That's what I push back. The neat thing about um, Vector is that it's templated, which means you can change its type. So we change from int to float, and now I print that out, and it works. OK, so you've probably seen this, whatever. Um, now let's just take a very sort of high level look uh, at, at a pseudocode partial implementation of Vector. Um, if you implement, implement a class template, uh, you can see this is the basic structure. You write template, and then you provide a template parameter list. Uh, and in this case, we have a single type T. This T is going to be a stand-in for a type that we define later when we actually instantiate the vector. And so we can use T anywhere throughout the definition. And uh, so this is, this is good. This is a good use of templates. And uh, you know this is probably something that uh, many of you have encountered before. Also, in addition to class templates, you can have function templates. Uh, so here's a function template for max, which allows us to call max with any, any type. Um, I'm going to run this on 6766. Uh, okay, max successfully printed out uh, 67, which is the max. And notice here um, one small difference between uh, this and um, the class template is that you do not need to explicitly specify the type when you call a function template, when you, when you make a uh, template function here. Uh, it's, the compiler is just going to infer the type based on the arguments you give it, but you can always uh, manually specify the type if you want. And so now uh, C uh, is, in fact, represented in ASCII by the number 67. So max still works uh, on characters as well as it does on integers. OK, so that's all the basic stuff. This all makes a lot of sense. There are good reasons for supporting these features. But um, since this is C++, they aren't going to stop at what is good and reasonable. They're going to keep adding features. So let's look at some of that. Uh, another thing you can do with templates, and now this is starting to maybe get slightly less uh, mundane, is uh, you can supply integer arguments to templates. So what we do here is we're specifying a capital I integer uh, in the, in the uh, template definition. And then we are, in the constructor, specifying lowercase i, multiplying them together, and printing them to make the multiply and print class. And we'll just see that here. Multiply and print 3 and 4. And that gets 12, as expected. So yeah, you can do uh, integers and in templates. You can do uh, Booleans, any kind of integer value. You can't do strings or floats. OK? Uh, and actually, there are some uses for this. Um, here's a fixed vector implementation. This is just like uh, normal vector, except uh, maybe you know, you've heard normal vector. It allocates from the heap. And on consoles, you know, that's really bad because uh, Fragmentation will, will kill you on consoles. Uh, there's no virtual memory support or whatever. And so um, what you might do is you create a fixed vector, which has a uh, sort of a maximum capacity you specify at the beginning when you instantiate the vector, and then it never performs any um, dynamic allocations. And we actually do use this in our code base a little bit. Uh, you know, It's kind of nasty, but sometimes in a pinch, it's OK. All right, I'm going to talk about another thing. So um, right now, I made a class called floats are special. And uh, currently, it's a lie. Uh, but what I can do is I can actually specialize this template on floats. And so here is the uh, syntax for template specialization. And I'll show what that means as well. Basically, um, once you've defined a template like we did up here, you can go ahead and redefine it using the following syntax. You write template. You have an empty parameter list. And then um, at the end of the class name, you sort of have to fill in the original template parameter list. In this case, we're filling it in with float. OK, so now we're going to uh, try using it here. Notice I do floats are special for int, floats are special for i. What happens is that uh, compiler is going to do some sort of pattern matching at this point. So when we pass in this int here, the compiler is going to say, hey, do I know about any specializations that take an int? Well, I know one about float. Is float int? No. So then it has to just say, oh, I'm going to use the default. If we pass in float, it says, hey, this float is float. Um, I are smart. And then uh, it's going to use this. 
Um, all right, and we can actually see if I define these two things differently, then uh, we run this. <laughs> <laughs> and you can see uh, they are in fact, um, you know, it is correctly specializing. So that's kind of neat. And uh, turns out that um, in the standard library, there's a very kind of big instance of this. Uh, vector of bool has a specialized version, which, which is a special optimized version. So um, in C++, they optimize vector of bool. And I'm actually going to uh, show you here, I, I have this profile header, which I wrote. And that defines profile block. And so what I've done is I've wrapped these, um, these little calls here, which are basically pushing 10 million values onto the back of a vector of characters and onto the back of a vector of bools. And we're going to see just how optimized uh, vector of bools is. OK. Ah, yes, yes. That's some classic uh, C++. So uh, it turns out vector bool is not optimized for speed. It is optimized for space. Normally, a bool takes up eight bits in a vector form. It only takes up one per bool. But um, this has certainly confused me sometimes when I had a vector of bools and it was going extremely slowly. But it's, uh, that's the reason. So yes, the power of specialization, the wonderful things it can do for you. Make your code slower. Um, <laughs> so mm, here's another one. This is a more complicated uh, template already. You can see in this guy, we're actually uh, at having two um, types in the parameter list. And what this guy does is it takes uh, an object of type from uh, here, and then it casts it to type 2, and it prints the results. And so let's see this in action. Um, calling cast and print down here, we're casting a float to an int. Compiling, you can see at the bottom, it does successfully truncate the float. So let's try it uh, differently. Let's try doing a const char star to int, c string to int. This is uh, 67. Let's see what we get. Um, OK, and we aren't getting 67, uh, but actually that does make sense. Uh, the compiler is taking us literally, which is its job. And we're saying, hey, cast this pointer to an int, because a C string is just a pointer to a bunch of characters. And so what we're seeing is the pointer value. All right, but if we want to um, actually change the definition of cast and print so that it, uh, it's going to parse the string and interpret it as the value 67, we can do that using specialization. OK, this is just like uh, what we saw with floats are special. Uh, notice I'm using a2i here. That's just a standard library function for parsing strings to integers. And if I run this, 67 is printed out. OK, that's great. Uh, now what if we want to add another cast and print, this time from string to character? Uh, well, uh, let's just give it a shot. Uh, OK, so mildly confusing error. We're going to see much more interesting errors uh, later on here. That's, that's the nature of template metaprogramming. But um, yeah. So, uh, so OK, it's not working. There's no valid specialization or template definition it can use. And what we could do is we could specialize again. We could make a cast and print specialization that takes a char and a uh, C string. Or we can do this. So what I've just done here is I've actually added back the two type name in our specialization. So this is still an, a sort of a, a late defined type. So we can actually use this too as a type stand-in in our specialization. And this is known as partial specialization. So um, this is a valid thing you can do. You can sort of have template arguments on your specialized versions of your structures. And if we actually run this now, we can see, yes, it successfully converts uh, the string 67 to the sort of ASCII representation of 67C. Um, OK, so let's move on here. Uh, yeah, OK, let's do a, a, an even more sort of interesting um, partial specialization. We have this structure called star counter. And the purpose of star counter's existence is to take a type and then tell us how many stars are on that type. That's cool. Uh, so int uh, would be 0, uh, int star should be 1. OK, well, how are we going to implement this? I've got um, you know, an attempt here. Let's just see how well this does. Hey, not bad, 50% right. So that's pretty good. Um, but let's, let's try to make it even better. Uh, so let's do a specialization. And it's going to look a little weird, maybe, if you haven't seen this before. But I'm just going to type this and now compile. And look what happened. It, it uh, totally did what we wanted it to. OK, and so how does this work? Well, as I said earlier, the compiler uh, does pattern matching when um, it tries to figure out which template to use. And so in the case of this uh, int star here, what it tries to do is it's going to look at our specialization, because the compiler always looks at specializations first before it looks at uh, the defaults. And it's going to say, hey, is there 
a type u such that u star equals int star. In fact, there is. It's going to say, yeah, int. Uh, if u equals int, then u star equals int star. And so it's going to say, okay, I can plug, uh, you know, I can use this definition for this uh, template instantiation. So that's why we get value equals one. If we try to, you know, plug int in here, there's no um, u where u star equals int. There's no like you know, anti-star or something in, in uh, C++, though they may add that in, uh, in OX, I've heard. Um, anyway, that's nonsense. Uh, so, <laughs> if we try now to do uh, int star star star, of course, I'm sure you always use this data type everywhere, um, but, you know, it's good for counting stars. Yeah, if you're uh, Minecraft, for instance, um, maybe. But, uh, so now, let's see if this works. Ah, it's wrong again. Um, so here's how we're going to fix it. I'm just going to type this out, run it, and you can see it works. But this is really weird looking now. We've actually just defined a structure using the structure itself, which uh, in normal structure definitions, that's really not allowed. Um, but uh, this is a structure template. And so just like uh, with um, functions, how you can define functions recursively, you can define structure templates recursively. And I'm just going to walk through what the compiler is thinking when it encounters this ridiculous code. First of all, I was thinking this is ridiculous, but it's, it's a compiler, it's going to work. So um, we say, hey, compiler, star counter me for int star star star. And the compiler is going to say, well, I got the specialization. Hey, if u equals int star star, then u star equals int star star star. <laughs> Hope you guys like hearing that word. Uh, so then it's going to say, hey, value is going to equal 1 plus star counter value of u, which is equal to int star star. So it's going to say, hey, OK, what's the value of uh, you know, star counter int star star? It's going to say, well, if I plug it in here, if u equals int star, then u star equals int star star. Again, value is 1 plus star counter value of int star. Plug it in again, OK, uh, u equals int now. Uh, so the value of that's going to be 1 plus the star counter value of int, well, we already know star counter value of int is zero. All right, so what's basically going on is kind of through all that crunching, uh, for int star star star, the value is one plus one plus one plus zero, or three. And so this is actually sort of the first real template metaprogram that we've seen so far. You know, because this is actually using templates to perform calculation. Uh, so that's bizarre, but it's kind of neat. Um, and let's now take this seriously, and let's actually sort of consciously try to write some template metaprograms here. And uh, what we're going to try is um, we're going to try to write factorial. You know, factorial, it's uh, that function where um, you have a number, yeah, and uh, uh, you do the exclamation point, and that is going to equal, you know, so in the case of 5, it equals 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, which happens to be 120. And we can implement that normally in uh, C++ like this. Um, this is just sort of does exactly what I just said. It'll sort of count down the numbers. And uh, if I print out the result here, you can see that, in fact, it is 120. Um, but there's something interesting about factorial. If we take another look at it, we can see factorial of 5 is actually equal to factorial 5 times factorial of 4, which uh, factorial of 4 is equal to 4 times factorial of 3. So factorial is a recursive function. And uh, C++ supports recursive functions. So let's change the definition here. So now I'm writing factorial recursively. This is sort of a recursive, a functional definition of factorial. And what we see here is the first line is the base case, where we just say it's a law of nature that if someone tries to get factorial uh, of 1, that is 1. That's just something we take for granted. And then otherwise, um, factorial is just the algorithm I defined, 1 times factorial, or sorry, uh, the value times factorial of the value minus 1. And we can see this in action, 120. So this works. All right, so now let's try to implement uh, that sort of functional recursive algorithm with templates. This should look very, very similar to star counter, like we just saw. So uh, I'm just going to walk through this here. You can see um, it takes this, uh, this template called fac, takes an int as its parameter, and then to value, the static constant value, which we saw in star counter, it's going to basically run that exact algorithm I just uh, described, i times factorial of i minus 1. And then uh, the base case is simply a specialization. Um, so we say, hey, the factorial of 1, law of the universe, that equals 1. 
and uh, let's try this out. 120. So this works. Okay. Uh, it's it's ugly. It's weird, um, but it is calculating. And uh, let's just do a real quick sort of equivalency here, sort of looking at uh, the functional recursive factorial and compare that to uh, the template meta programming one. And we can see there are very straightforward equivalencies. Where basically the function name is the structure name, the parameter list is the template parameter list. Uh, you know, if else becomes specialization, and you know, instead of returning like we do in the function, we assign to value. Okay, so there are these equivalencies. It's sort of becoming clear how we might translate a functional recursive algorithm to template metaprogramming. Um, but what is not clear at this point is why on earth we'd ever want to, because uh, this is just clearly a much uglier version of the previous function, which um, you know, maybe if you're programming C++, <laughs> ugly is what you like. But all right, uh, here's the reason. Here is the well, just by far neatest thing about functional or uh, template metaprogramming here. So I've defined factorial. Now on line four, I've defined a structure template called evaluator. And this guy, um, actually I've not defined, I've just declared it. Uh, this guy takes an integer and has no definition. And when the compiler encounters a structure with no definition and you try to instantiate that structure, it's gonna throw an error. That's what's supposed to happen. So uh, let's see. Um, what does happen? I'm trying to instantiate evaluator passing in uh, factorial 5. All right, and well, okay, just as expected, uh, there was an error, but let's look a little closely at that error. You see that? That's actually the result of running this algorithm. So that's the crazy thing. That's the neat thing about template metaprogramming. It's actually being calculated inside of the compiler. All right, uh, so with template metaprogramming, the runtime isn't your runtime. The compiler is your runtime. And uh, that's sort of why it's called metaprogramming in the first place. You're sort of um, you know, hijacking the compiler. And so that's, that's really neat. Um, and it turns out that template metaprogramming, uh, this was never designed. The C++ authors just wanted you know, to be able to define vector. But it um, turns out that uh, accidentally they defined a um, Turing-complete, purely functional programming language in their template mechanism. Which means, um, you know, if we sort of look at other sort of functional languages, we should be able to kind of copy the things they do using template metaprogramming. And so uh, we're going to look. At, ah, got ahead of myself. All right, this is just a define here. Uh, I'm just sort of wrapping um, evaluator in this eval macro, and that just works, and we'll use it later. Anyway, uh, so whatever. Uh, so here is uh, a list as you would write it in Lisp or Scheme. And so maybe some of you have encountered, hello, some of you have encountered Lisp or Scheme. Um, woo, yeah. All right. Uh, we should talk later. Um, so so uh, Lisp and Scheme, these are languages that like to be functional. They like to live in the functional world. And uh, specifically, um, they really like singly linked lists because singly linked lists are these nice sort of functional recursive data structures. And so this is defining a singly linked list, one, two, three. But um, if you actually think about what a singly linked list is, it's a node that points to a value and then points to another node, which is the next part of the list. And it goes on and on like that until one node eventually points to nil or null. And so um, another way to write a singly linked list in Lisp or Scheme is like this. We can use cons, which kind of constructs a node, in this case, a node with a value of three and a pointer of nil. And we can kind of embed these conses in one another you know, recursively to create the list. So this is exactly the same as list one, two, three, which I just showed you. OK, well, since I'm claiming that uh, template metaprogramming is this Turing complete purely functional language, we should be able to do the same in template metaprogramming. And in fact, we can. Here is a singly linked list node representation in template metaprogramming. Uh, notice here the next pointer is actually a type name. So this is another thing to add to our equivalency list where pointers in functional programming are just type names uh, in, in template metaprogramming. OK, so here's how we would construct our list in template metaprogramming. Um, notice here I added this, uh, this little null type. What is that? Whatever we want it to be. So this is just, uh, this is just a structure we call null. It's, it's just an identifier, because you know, that's sort of the level at which template metaprogramming works. All right, and what we can do is, um, also define an equivalent to the list function in Lisp. Um, this is just a macro kind of syntactic sugar. 
So that thing I just wrote can be represented easily like this here. And uh, okay, so let's try to do some cool stuff with this. Oh, so yeah, I'm gonna wrap all this. Take one last good look at it. I'm wrapping it all in list.h. And this is node definition approximately for reference. And now let's try to implement sum here. The, this is the sum function in template metaprogramming. And what sum does is it tries to uh, add up all the values in a list. And so the algorithm is going to work by taking a list and it's going to take the, the value of the head of the list and sort of recursively add that to the sum of the rest of the list. OK? Oh, and uh, let's give that a shot here. So I'm going to call sum inside of main, return the value. OK, and we get some errors. Oh, we get a lot of errors. Ah, this is, this, this is template metaprogramming at its finest. <laughs> we like nasty template metaprogramming. OK, well, um, yeah, so this is a situation where um, we actually have far more errors than we have code. So uh, <laughs> rather than trying to parse the error, it's probably better to just eyeball the code like Grandpa Joe used to do. Um, let's see here. OK, well, the, the problem is we are missing the base case for sum. Oh, that was fast. So now here it is. Um, uh, you can see uh, we're saying, hey, sum of null, sum of the empty list is just 0. You know, you aren't adding anything. Now let's run it. Compiling, uh, it says 15. Well, 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 is 15. And in fact, uh, we don't need to print this out. We can just use our good friend eval. And look at this. It is happening inside the compiler. All right, uh, so that's cool. Let's try something juicier here. Uh, oh, God, no, sorry, let's not. Um, <laughs> we, we are not ready yet. Uh, first, I need to explain one little thing I glossed over. This confused me a whole lot when I first started implementing a bunch of templates. Um, it's not really interesting in any way, but it is this annoying thing you've got to know when you're writing templates. So type name. I actually use type name inside the definition of the structure. And here's the reason. OK, so uh, let's look at an instance where you have two structures, one called var and one called type. And they both define something called value. Now, var defines a variable, a constant variable called value. And type defines a type def to int called value. OK, so um, that's confusing. That, that'll be uh, fun to debug later. But um, anyway, uh, there's nothing that stops us from doing that. And we can also define a function. Uh, function template called fun, and we could at this point pass either var or type to this guy because fun doesn't do anything. But if we define fun to use um, value, to use t colon colon value like a variable, then well, it would not make any sense to pass type to fun, so we're not going to do that. We're just going to pass var, and you can see that you know if we just do sort of type substitution for t here, var colon colon value should equal 42, and let's just see if that works. OK, it does. It prints out 42, so that's good. Um, let's redefine fun here. Uh, we just don't know what fun is. OK, so fun now is trying to use a value as a type. OK, and if we were to uh, plug type colon colon value in here, that would equal int. And so int i equals 100, print that out. This should return 100. And we see, oh god, all right. All right, so we see this again. Our good friend template metaprogramming error. This one is actually somewhat helpful. Um, that, that almost never happens, but it's telling us, hey, note, on line 9, you meant type name, t value. All right, and so let's actually do that. And if we run the code, we can see it does work. But the question is, why do we have to do that? Well, and basically the answer is that uh, C++ is essentially impossible to parse. The, uh, the specifiers of the language sort of recognize that this is a, a complex language. And they decided to throw the compiler writers a bone by saying, all right, guys, it's, it's hard to parse this stuff. If you encounter t colon colon value or anything of that nature in a template definition, just treat that as a variable. Um, and we're going to force the programmers to actually decorate it with a type name keyword if it's a type. So you guys don't have to worry. We're going to offload this one on the programmers. So that's uh, the lovely reason we, we have to write type name in these templates. Um, OK. So let's, uh, let's move on here. This is actually not really metaprogramming at all. This is just a function that prints out lists, um, our template metaprogramming lists. You know, remember those. Uh, and we can see this in action here. 
I'm saying print one, two, three, four, five, and it does that. Okay, don't worry about looking at it right now. Uh, these slides will be available online. You can always look at them later. Here's a uh, list sort. Hope you're catching all this here. <laughs> So I'm, unfortunately, I'm not going to get into this uh, at all. There's, there's not enough time. Um, but I just wanted to show that it is, in fact, possible to do quite complex things purely in template metaprogramming. And uh, so you can see here, I'm passing the list 4, 1, 3, 5, 2 to sort. And if I run this, compiling 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So yes, this is sorting done entirely at compile time. And oh god, I maybe can actually uh, add a little eval thing here, and we should be able to see this. I should never be doing live coding. Uh, nah, we aren't going to see it. Whatever. <laughs> yeah, this this does work. Take my word for it. OK, so um, yay, that's neat. But is it useful? Uh, it is usable. I can tell you that on our first PSN game, Flow, uh, we use template metaprogramming extensively all over the code base. It was very, very fun code to write. Not so much to read, but um, <laughs> there was a grave consequence to all that. And uh, that's um, Flow took 22 minutes to compile by the end. <laughs> and uh, Flow is known as um, Pac Man with Bloom applied. So, um, so we don't use template metaprogramming as much anymore. But there are a few key ways uh, in which we still use it. And actually, um, one of the, the most important features of everything I've just showed you is actually this. This is one of the most useful bits of template metaprogramming. Um, and it's, it's done a little bit differently. This is actually what we use in our code base. So what we do is we have this, uh, this um, structure template called static assert, which takes a bool. And notice how um, the actual template is not defined. So if we ever tried to, if the compiler ever decided, hey, we're going to try to instantiate this template definition, it would throw an error. But we specialize static assert for true. And we do define that. So if we pass an expression that evaluates to true to static assert, no problem. If we pass an expression that evaluates to false to static assert, compiler error. And we just, we just wrap that up in uh, this little static assert macro here. And uh, you can see that in action. And this is really useful in cases where you know you have a constant or something, and it like it has to be even or it has to be odd or whatever. You need to specify some property of the constant, and it's specifiable at compile time. That way, I can say, hey, whoops, I tried to compile this code, and it's telling me, hey, line 12, static assert, false, and I can read it and be like, oh, silly me, it's uh, not divisible by two, <laughs> something. Anyway, and now it is. Uh, I changed it, and um, well doesn't tell me anything. It compiled fine. Uh, so static assert, super useful. And our actual definition is sort of based on boosts, whatever. It, it looks more like this. And the only reason we do that is now we can define static assert outside of uh, function calls. So static assert false you know, stops me. Static assert true compiles just fine. So this is an interesting little byproduct template metaprogramming that is, we use every day when we're writing code. OK, now that was uh, all I'm going to say about template metaprogramming directly, we're going to move on to the subject of reflection, which is sort of what I covered at the beginning. We're going to define uh, you know, the meta register variable and meta register function uh, things. So uh, C++ actually has reflection built in. They made an attempt. Guys, they made a good attempt. And uh, they have a type ID is this sort of special function um, that approximately has this, uh, this signature. And type ID returns a type info object, uh, which basically looks like this. Type info has a bunch of junk in it. Um, you can compare types for equality, and this is like kind of a less than. And it does have this name operator, which seems like it could be useful. So let's just uh, give that a shot here. Let's, let's give C++ the benefit of the doubt and try to use the stuff they're providing us. Um, so what I've done is I've defined on line four through six an integer, a structure, and a function. They all walk into a bar. No, uh, and um, uh, I'm using type ID to print out the name of these types, of the types they represent. OK, and what do we get here? I can, oh, that's nice. Thank you very much. Uh, so our integer is called i, for some reason. I, I guess I can see that. Uh, struct, my struct is called 8 my struct, and the function takes the cake here. 
FVI ate my struct E. Okay. <laughs> Wonderful. That's that's how did it know that's exactly what I wanted. But um, so it turns out. Uh, as wonderful as this is, it's not even standard. These names are completely compiler dependent. So this is GCC we're seeing, but in Visual Studio, it's going to be something totally different. So great idea, not so great execution. Well, OK, let's take the idea and change the execution. We can do that. Let's implement our own type ID. And it's not maybe as snappy a name, but I have this thing called get meta type here. And uh, we can overload get meta type so that um, you know, it can return different things for any types we're interested in. You know, int, float, character. A lot of this stuff could be templated. Um, string, uh, vectors, matrices, eventually classes, but I'm not going to get into how to do that stuff. Uh, anyway, you can see git meta type is returning a type. Or sorry, is returning a meta type. Well, what is a meta type? Uh, it is sort of a type that describes a type. You know, that's, that's meta again coming in. Um, so uh, here we go. Uh, let's define some some methods on this guy. So one thing we might want to know about the type is the name and sort of the proper name this time. We might also want to know the size. We might want to have a way to allocate and delete, placement allocate and delete, um, convert to number, convert to string, do a cast, and you know, this can go on and on. Just all sorts of different things, uh, you know, and just basically anything you're interested about doing to a type, you can just kind of toss it into this guy, and then um, what we do is we have sort of all the uh, these pure virtual functions in meta type and then we create for each type we're interested in uh, a specific version of, um, of meta type and so like for integer we can have it uh, we can have int meta type and we can have that inherit from meta type and then we can define whatever functions you know we want so you know, in this case we're just going to look at name and size of and by the way like this this looks like it might be really bleak and might explode to tons and tons of types. Um, it's possible to use templates to make it so you only need to define a handful of these things. Um, so you might have to find six or so uh, specific meta types. Anyway, um, so here's the one for integer. I'm also going to do char star. This is the C string. And so uh, we're just, we have functions now that return the name and the size of these. Uh, types and notice also how for each of them I've actually created an instance. I create an instance of int meta type, an instance of char star meta type, and oh my god! And I'm just going to uh, define get meta type, um, which uh, you know, given a type, will return the correct instance of the meta type. Okay, just absorb all of this and uh, boom. Okay, it's in the header now. Can't see it anymore. Ha. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, just remember it's um, uh, name and size up. So here's an int, here's a C string, and what I'm going to do is just print out uh, using get meta type. I'm going to print out the name and, and the size of both of these things. Um, boom. Okay, so that does work. Isn't that magical? Well, actually, no. It's just kind of stupid because you know in this context here, I could just print out int or whatever, and it worked just the same. Um, but uh, let's see. I'm not going to do that. So. Um, what this lets us do, though, is write this function here, print meta type info. All right, and with this guy, we just pass it a meta type, and then it can basically run that same code I just I just wrote. Um, but this will work too. So this is kind of a small change. It doesn't look like much, but actually, this this is pretty meaningful here because what we've done is we've we've passed this notion of type off to a different function. Well, we've we've done this. This is this is now type reflection. What we have here, we have this uh, runtime data representation about the nature of the structure of our code. So, meta type is telling us about the nature of types. So, and types are an aspect of code. So, what we can do now is pass around information about types, and we can define functions that operate on types generically. And we could always do that with templates, but now with meta type. Uh, we can do that with non-templates, so things that are operating at runtime can now operate on types. So that's a little bit interesting. Let's keep pushing it. Let's see what we can do. So now I'm going to define a meta type for number, or I'm going to define the two number and two string functions. These are slightly more complicated than the name and size up we just saw. So how do you convert? Oh, so first of all, what does two number even mean? All right. So here is our int meta type, and uh, it takes a void pointer. 
So what I expect is that this void pointer, whoever is using this two number function, is going to be a nice human being, and they're going to pass in an int pointer because this is the int meta type. All right, and so that means I'm just going to be able to cast it. I'm going to say, hey, you're an int. And uh, well, how do you convert an int to a number? That's difficult. Uh, you dereference. I know that's not difficult. Huh, sarcasm. Um, so that's how you do two number for integer. Two string, eh, this is going to be ugly, guys. I'm sorry. Sorry. But uh, what we're doing, we're just doing sprintf. I mean, this isn't super clean. This will break down in multi threaded scenarios, and there are ways this can go wrong. But you know, for our purposes, this will be OK. And this is just going to write uh, sort of the value of number into a string here and return that. Okay, so we defined two number and two string for integer. So now we can generically convert integers to numbers and strings. And now let's uh, let's do the same thing for char star here. So first we'll do the two string for this guy. That's very very simple. A char star is already a string. Simple dereference. And then two number. Well, our good friend a to i probably should have used a to f. Whatever. This will two number is actually going to be two int. Uh, Whatever, that works. Again, in the header. Want to see that? All right, just soak it in. Uh, all right, it's gone. Um, in the header, and we're going to try using it. So here's int, here's string, um, 42, 300, both very culturally relevant numbers these days. Uh, and I'm going to now do a little switcheroo here, switcheroo, and uh, convert the string using meta type and two number to an integer. And I'm going to convert the integer using get meta type and two string to a string. And let's print this out. All right, printing out J and T. And it works. So 42, 300 became 342. Uh, but you know, this is totally generic. I could convert integers to integers and strings to strings. Oh, joy. Um, but it does work. Uh, but what this suggests now is that we can actually um, kind of use this we can use this uh, functionality uh, to define uh, a more interesting function. What we can do is we can create cast, okay? And I'll show you how this works. So cast here, if we look at the integer version, uh, two is going to be an integer pointer. We expect the person to be nice and pass an integer pointer. And then these two guys, the from pointer can be anything as long as the meta type they passed in is the correct meta type for that from pointer. Okay, and in that case, what we can do is we can use the from types to number function to convert this arbitrary from pointer to a number, cast it to an int, and assign that to, to the past in int. Okay, so this is a way to cast from arbitrary things, arbitrary types that successfully implement to number to integers. And we can do the same uh, kind of deal for, for the string. Um, we just say, hey, uh, yo, foreign type. Uh, turn yourself into a string, and I'll, I'll assign that to my type. OK, so now we've defined a cast on our meta type. Again, it's in the header, sorry. Uh, and uh, we're going to call that. Um, I've got an integer here. I've got a float here. I'm using uh, get meta type to get the meta type of the integer. I'm calling the cast function. And um, then I'm saying, OK, store into this integer using uh, this float. So this is all kind of happening generically. And you can see, if I print this out, integer now contains 2, which is the truncated version of 2.5. That is a successful cast. And uh, we can sort of use this meta type function to implement a generic um, cast function here, which uh, basically you say, hey, you specify explicitly a type, and then you pass in um, you know, a piece of data and its corresponding meta type, and then it will cast it to whatever type you specify. And so I can say, hey, cast to an int float and, uh, or you know, this, this float that I'm giving you, and there. It, it does exactly what it did before. Um, so again, yeah, we've got this generic uh, sort of runtime version of type. Okay, so at this point, let's go back to our original example, and let's try to actually figure out how to implement this meta register var thing. Um, so uh, this, remember, this is like the second slide I showed something was this. And so uh, it turns out meta register var, well, all that's doing is defining a meta variable. So we have meta type, now we have meta variable. And uh, here's the, the structure. Um, 
you can imagine sort of what we would want, like what is the data we'd want to know about our code relative to global variables, and we might want a name, an address, and the meta type. That should be enough. Uh, actually, what we might also add is like the line number the variable is defined on and the, the file that the variable is defined into. That could be useful, but you know, we'll do it later. And it's, uh, it's very easy if we have a templated constructor to uh, assign to these, these types here. We can just take in the name and the variable and assign it. So this is meta variable. I believe it's going to get slooped up into a header. Yes. Okay. Uh, so, you know, not too complicated. Meta variable takes name, address, and type. That's what it has. And so now, maybe, with that in mind, we can define our meta print variables function. Um, yeah, but we're missing one thing. So, so the variables are being successfully registered, but there's no way we can access them generically at this point. Okay, so we need one more little modification. But we're almost there. We almost have a reflection for variables. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to find this class called AutoLister. Okay, and I'm just going to write out all the code right now. I'm not going to explain it line by line um, yet, but here's how AutoLister works. And so uh, the way it works is you have some structure or class, and you have that class inherit from AutoLister, and then you pass uh, the, the class, you know, the inheriting class to AutoLister as the template parameter. So um, first of all, this is just a ridiculous, very kind of uncomfortable, dirty looking kind of snake eating its own tail sort of thing. But uh, it's sort of telling of C++ that this actually has a cute name. This is the curi uh, curiously recurring template pattern here. So this is, this is something that's so common in C++, even though it looks ridiculous that it has its own name. But anyway, the way what this is doing, what AutoLister is doing, is it is basically uh, using some sort of constructor magic here to create a singly linked list of every instance of whatever type you pass to it. So um, basically, just by having meta variable inherit from AutoLister, we can now access every single instance of meta variable that ever exists. OK? So now we are ready. Uh, here's all that code I used to have on the screen. Well, let's define uh, meta print variables. OK? And now, uh, just using sort of stuff defined in AutoLister, uh, we can iterate over all the variables. And then using the fields of the variables and the toString method on uh, meta type, this should work. And in fact, it does. Look at that. So um, we just successfully printed out all of our, of our variables. You know, and I could add a new one. Yeah. And uh, it should. Sorry, guys. <laughs> a tough day. Uh, yeah, and it's in there somewhere. There. It, it did work. So um, there you go. Now we have variable reflection. And we are reaching the tail end here. Uh, one thing left to do in this talk, and uh, that is function level reflection. That's the last thing we're going to go over here. OK, brace yourselves. So what do we want for reflection of functions? What, what's the kind of runtime information we want to know? Name, yeah, we probably do want to know that. Uh, in addition, we probably want to know the, um, the function signature. What does it return? What are its arguments? What, how many arguments does it have? Uh, and then finally, the last thing we want, this one's a little bit complicated and we aren't going to think about it quite yet, is we want some magical function uh, that can, can uh, sort of encapsulate the notion of calling arbitrary function. So we need this single function apply that takes some kind of weird parameters um, that can uh, call a function that you know, takes no arguments and returns nothing, or a function that takes eight arguments and you know, returns um, int star star star, or whatever. Um, so uh, name's not interesting. Let's first look at, oh, sorry. Before we do anything, yes, meta function is also going to be auto-listed. And uh, it's going to be in a separate list than the meta variables because of the magic of the curiously recurring template uh, Better. <laughs> okay, so um, yeah, let's see. Let's define uh, these these guys. Let's figure out how to do that. Function signature. So let's imagine a class function signature. We're going to give it the same um, same interface because we're lame. Uh, 
And so if we imagine somehow that our function signature object can get the following pieces of data, can get a pointer to the correct return type for whatever function it's representing, can get an array of pointers to the arguments and the arg count, then, well, it's totally trivial to implement this interface. But now the question is, how do we assign to this, this data here? And um, well, that's too hard. So let's assume for now we just want to uh, support functions that take nothing and return nothing. Those are great functions. <laughs> um, aren't, we, aren't we doing useful stuff? So uh, here we go. This works. Um, notice I'm, I'm kind of cheating here. I'm using this function called get meta type by type. Yeah, you should also define this somewhere. Um, it's easy. This is just a templated thing, whatever. Uh, so <laughs> trivial. Um, so uh, yeah, here we go. This does work. Uh, we can now represent any useless function we want. Um, well, what if we wanted to expand a little bit? What if instead of just sort of defaulting to this, we say, yo, dude, who's using me? Uh, <laughs> pass, <laughs> pass your function pointer. Um, and we can do that. This, by the way, is a, a, how you write a function pointer in line, if you haven't seen that. And um, so now, you know, if they pass a function that does nothing, that works. And then um, what we could do, though, is we could also say, hey, if you happen to have a function that takes two floats and returns an int, we can also support that. Um, you know, and this is just doing that, saying, hey, uh, if they pass a function pointer that returns an int, takes two floats, well, the return type is int, the arguments are two floats, the arg count is two, and this works. Okay, so we support a lot more functions now. Unfortunately, if you look at all functions that could possibly exist, um, there are few more. <laughs> so uh, the, the answer, though, is we should, just, we should just write more constructors. We should write constructors for all those things. Let's do it, guys. Yes, let's do it. Let's go. Except we aren't gonna we aren't gonna be silly about it. We're gonna be C plus plus about it here. So what we're gonna do is we're actually gonna we're gonna get ready for this. Define templated overloaded constructors. You don't get much more C plus plus than that, folks. So uh, notice now, I've uh, I've templated our original guy. So the return type is kind of unspecified, and uh, that means magically now we support all functions that take no arguments and return anything. We, we support all functions that take no arguments. Great. Uh, we can overload this constructor uh, now with a different template here. And this guy supports all functions that take one argument and you know, can return anything. So now we support all functions that take one argument. And yeah, we had to rewrite the constructor, but that's not so bad. And we can just keep doing that. We can do it again. That works. And we can do it again. And uh, in, uh, in our flower and our journey code bases at work, uh, we actually define these up to um, up to eight arguments. So that's what we do. And actually, we use this terrible Lua preprocessor. So the code kind of looks like this. I don't know. It's it's garbage, but whatever. Um, it's really short. Really short. Uh, doesn't take a many lines at all. Um, and yeah, but now function signature can work for an arbitrary number of arguments. We can kind of figure out any function signature. So I just schloop that all up into our little header schloop uh, and. Uh, now I'm defining this function here, void, foo, it takes an int and a float. Um, let's create a function signature object that uses that, and now let's return all this data. Uh, you know, I'm returning the return type and the argument type and the arg count, printing all that out. And if we look at it here, look, return type equals void, arg1, sorry, arg0 equals int, arg1 equals float, arg count equals two. So it works. Uh, our function signature actually works. That's, that's kind of cool, and we used a very bizarre C++ template -y method to do it. Um, so let's look at our meta function again. We're doing pretty well here. Looks like we can define all these guys now. Um, so now it is finally time to tackle the last big thing. How do we make apply? What should apply even look like? Well, so apply is this function which is kind of generically encapsulating the notion of calling a function. OK, so what happens when you call a function? What goes into that? Well, uh, a function returns an argument. Most functions do, or maybe they return nothing, but whatever. Functions can return an argument. So our apply should be able to have some variable uh, to hold the return value. 
Well, the other thing, functions can take an arbitrary number of arguments in. Okay, so apply should have a, uh, an array of variables um, that we can pass it. And frankly, I think this is probably going to do it. Um, you know, functions take arguments in, return an argument out, and you know, everything else just goes in the calling of the function. So this function signature, uh, this function signature might work, but we need to define variable now. Well, that's actually pretty easy at this point. Um, this is what our variable structure is going to look like. Uh, we're going to have a pointer to a piece of data, and then we're going to have a pointer to the corresponding meta type for that data. Because using the meta, sy the meta um, reflection system, uh, we can sort of do any kind of arbitrary operation we want on void pointers, treating them as, as data. This works. And you know we'll just add a little bit of uh, syntactic sugar here. This way, uh, this constructor lets you create variables, um, variable you know struct objects by passing in specific variables. So you can pass int to the constructor variable, and it'll just fill out v and m. And then we'll also create an empty variable uh, constructor. Notice um, here, uh, get meta type. I'm actually sort of essentially passing void to it, uh, and we saw this before. Um, but I had something else I was trying to trying to brush past you guys, so I ignored it then. Uh, anyway, um, so it turns out we also want to define a void meta type. Uh, this is really handy. It's handy to have something that represents nothing, um, oddly enough. And this guy is just going to be a bunch of no-ops. Um, so here's variable. And header time. All right, so uh, here it is. Um, let's actually try to define a version of apply. Okay, this one is not inside of our meta function class, but for now it'll be fine. Okay, so here's apply. I'm going to want to use apply to call twice. And guys, I got to warn you, this is going to look really dumb for a while, and then it'll look cool. So, <laughs> so go through the dumb, like work with me through the dumb, and, and get to the other side. Okay, so like that chicken, that, that brave chicken. So, um, so uh, here we go. If we assume again that um, the user of apply is a nice, humane individual, they're going to be passing in the correct variables for ret and for the arg uh, array. And so we can just cast those void pointers um, to the correct type. All right, so we're casting the argument to an int, and we're casting the return value to an int. And we don't even have to assume. We can actually assert that this is true, uh, because we can use you know, get meta type by type and compare. All right, so let's, let's try this out. Here's uh, you know, a couple of variables to store our uh, return type and our argument. Uh, here are some variable objects. They're actually going to you know, wrap these things up. And here's the call to apply. And here is printing out the results. OK, an awful lot of work to call the function twice. I know, yes, very dumb looking, whatever. Uh, OK, it does work, however. That's good. So um, look at the bottom here. Uh, notice I'm printing out apply with whatever argument we used is returning this result. So somehow, by calling this function, uh, the value of 20 got stored in this, this variable. So our apply function is working. All right, well, what happens now if we want to make the apply function slightly more interesting? What if we want to have thrice, OK, which is very similar to twice. It just multiplies the number by 3 instead of 2. Well, we can do that by adding a function pointer to the, uh, the function signature of apply. So now you actually have to pass in, uh, oh, and I'll just make a change there, and you need to pass in uh, the function you want to apply to. OK, but if I run this, there it works. OK, 10 times 3 equals 30. So apply is still good. It's finally starting to get a little bit interesting. There's a, there's a problem with this version of apply, though. If instead of passing in an int, we were to pass a float, say, what happens? It takes a long time. All right, and uh, it's asserting. And this is actually exactly what we told it to do. We said, hey, if you get a, a type that is uh, anything other than an int, you know, kill us. Uh, we're, we're that strict. We're hardcore. Um, but really, this is kind of dumb, right? Because C++, if you call a normal function that takes an int and you give it a float, it doesn't crash the compiler. It just does an automatic conversion for you. And so that's sort of what we should be doing here. And actually, if we remember back to the, the cast method that we defined on meta type, we can do that. So we're just going to use cast here. And now, you know, these slides will be available. You can analyze later if you want. And now, look, uh, passing in a float um, for the argument, 
works and is successfully multiplying, you know, converting that to an int, multiplying by three and returning. Uh, there's a little weird thing, probably not, not good to dwell on too much, but turns out if we pass in a string uh, and run this, that also works. That's just kind of a little byproduct of our system. Remember how we define two number on strings. C++ doesn't do this. I don't know, this is, a, this is another feature. <laughs> C++ wants to do this. It wishes it could. Um, okay, so that's great. We're making serious progress with our apply here. Well, what if now, instead of thrice, we want a pice function, which is going to multiply whatever we give it by pi. <laughs> um, well, this guy is a little bit different because it is going to return a float instead of an integer. Um, okay, and let's, uh, yeah, let's give it a shot here. I replace thrice with pice and, okay, error, not too surprising. Our apply function expects whatever you pass it to return an integer. Well, if we think back to our function signature example, we know how to solve this problem. Templates. Templates solve every problem. <laughs> um, so now I said, yo, apply. Yo, apply. <laughs> Take any function that takes one argument and, uh, <laughs> and returns anything. That's just how templates talk. Uh, they're from Brooklyn. Uh, so, <laughs> so now we can see um, it is successfully calling pice a 10 times pi truncated to an int because the return value is still an int type, just casts it, uh, is uh, 31. All right, so this apply is actually some serious business now. This isn't so dumb. Um, this is a fairly generic way of calling functions. And uh, you know, just like with uh, the function signature example, if we want to be able to call more functions or functions that take different numbers of arguments, we just need to define, oh god, <laughs> come back. We just need to define more versions of apply. So you can see here, you know, apply that takes nothing, apply that takes one argument, two arguments, and it could go on up to eight is what we use. Okay, uh, and I should just point out one more little issue with apply here. A lot of code is blasting at you. This apply is an apply that uh, takes no arguments. Um, I'm defining a function foo, which just prints out foo and returns zero, and I'm then using apply to call foo, okay? So compiling, that works, everything's fine, all is good in the land. But if I define bar, ah, bar, and this returns nothing, uh, and then I try to use apply on that, ah, error, okay, template, or I mean compiler error, and uh, basically what it's saying is, hey, uh, when I'm uh, figuring out the template type for this bar function, ret equals void, and then inside your function, I'm trying to say void r equals something. I'm trying to assign to void. That's madness. Um, and so what we have to do is actually define another version of apply that just is spe special for functions that take void. And uh, you can see now that this works. And so annoying, yes, but totally doable for, yeah, come on. Uh, for each uh, kind of level of apply now, we need to um, define two. But OK, it works. We are ready. We're ready to tackle meta function. Let's do this. So uh, let's include our lovely headers that we've been constructing here, function signature and apply. And uh, now let's do exactly what we did for um, function signature and let's assume somehow we can get the types we need. We won't worry about those types yet. And let's just start implementing our interface. So easy to assume we can get the name. Uh, similarly, it's pretty easy to assume we can get the function signature. So, you know, we'll just do a pass through. Maybe we should be returning the function signature as an object. Yeah, that'd probably be cleaner, whatever. So, um, it's uh, easy enough to imagine we can get a pointer to our function. This is a little ugly, a little shameful. But I've had, I've had far worse in the shame department. Um, so, so uh, what we got here is uh, this is kind of a void function pointer. Um, you can't officially cast a function pointer to void um, for really detailed reasons that I don't understand exactly, but the compiler says no. Uh, however, it is perfectly safe and legal to cast a function to another function type. So I'm just gonna say, hey, kind of by convention, the function that takes no arguments and, and returns nothing is the void function. So this is just whatever our function pointer actually is and the type is wrong, but who cares. So can we use this function pointer to implement our apply function? 
Okay, so uh, here I'm just saying, let's call the, the, the global apply, right? And the issue is, somehow, before we call this global apply, so the compiler doesn't explode, we need to cast our function to the real type, whatever our function actually represents. Um, the issue is, meta function is not templated. You know, this is, this is a runtime kind of type here, so we don't have this information available. But we could imagine that there's, uh, the, the power of imagination, folks. We could imagine there is this apply wrapper function, this wonderful magical thing, which um, takes our void function pointer and knows how to successfully cast it to the right type before calling the global apply. Okay, so let's imagine we can get a, a pointer to that. So here we go, we've got a pointer to our function and then we've got this other special uh, pointer to an apply function. Okay, well, turns out we can kind of define apply wrapper like this. Apply wrapper is a, a templated function. Um, it takes whatever the real function type is and notice the function signature takes the void function and does, well, it does exactly what I just said. I'm just kind of repeating myself. All right, congratulations. Uh, so. Now, if um, we define a templated constructor here, this looks very similar to our meta variable constructor. Um, it's actually very straightforward to define all of those pieces of data. Name, function, notice I have to explicitly cast the function to the void pointer, and then, you know, this is exactly what we expect. And this is, this is basically it. I guess, you know, we need to say, hey, meta register fun is just gonna create a, a function object, but we now have, um, function level reflection. We can operate on functions generically at runtime at this point. And so now, <laughs> read quickly. Uh, don't read, don't bother. Uh, this is the um, function we use for automatically binding things to Lua. And it's, it's 58 lines long, it's a little big, but um, this can bind any function that exists. Any function we register using this 58 lines of code uh, can get bound. So we write this once. People don't need to know anything about Lua in our um, in our office to uh, bind the functions they write to Lua. Okay, and uh, I'm actually going to show a little demo of this here. So um, let's let's write the demo kind of framework. Uh, basically, in the demo, we're going to create a Lua state and we're going to call MetaBind, which is that thing I just showed you, and you probably had no time to read. Um, and in addition to that, we're also going to uh, include glut. And you probably used glut, but you know, glut is just sort of a, a wrapper around windowing um, for OpenGL. And glut takes an update function, uh, and in that update function, all we're gonna do is run a Lua file called binddemo.lua. Okay, and so this is basically our, uh, our framework, but binddemo.lua can't do anything interesting yet. Um, we want binddemo.lua to be able to draw things, since this is you know, an OpenGL demo. Uh, so what we'd need is a quick little um, OpenGL binding to Lua. And I've, uh, <laughs> I've seen a couple of them. They run around 3,000 lines or so, uh, if you just write them out longhand. Um, this is eight lines. Um, it's not full, it's not full binding. And I'm cheating again, uh, meta register const. You've never seen this in your lives. But uh, this is very similar to meta register uh, variable. Very, very similar, hardly different. Um, okay, and so that is, this is our demo. And um, I've actually got it running right here. Uh, and when I press the next button, what's gonna happen is it's gonna start writing out Lua code. And uh, it's gonna be sort of, you know, reloading that code every frame. And so we're gonna kind of, we're just gonna see that this works basically. There's really no point to any of this. It just looks pretty. So here we go. Notice uh, it's calling OpenGL functions inside of Lua there. Um, and yeah, it's just doing some rendering here. Let's take a moment to sip our waters. Oh. <laughs> yeah, and there you go. That's the demo written in Lua. And that's my talk, guys. So thanks for listening. Thank you. Um, you guys got any questions? Oh yeah, so, uh, Brian's uh, friend. This wouldn't, no. <laughs> yeah, this wouldn't automatically work for member functions because they take this pointer and yeah. like implicitly, so you define a void class and type that like void function inside of that void 
Member functions, um, they're slightly different. You need to define a meta member function. Um, can't, off the top of my head, I'm sort of trying to remember. I know it's very, very similar to what I just showed you. Um, more templates are involved. I think, I, yeah, it, it, it's uglier, yeah. but the basic pattern is followed, okay. you know? And similar um, uh, member variables is a very similar thing. Uh, I will say for classes, um, I can just describe it very briefly. Uh, we do kind of have a common base class idiom inside of our, our code, so we have this base, call it class, I guess. Um, and you know, as much as possible, things inherit from that, and uh, that just kind of makes it so we can define a single meta type um, for class, and, and then through some other mechanisms inside class itself, uh, that meta type can kind of stand in for any class that then inherits from it. So it's a way to kind of avoid having to define tons and tons of individual meta types. Um, though, you know, if we have something that uh, does not inherit from class, like we're using a library class or something, and we want to bind a class from a, uh, an external library, we can still do that, and we do. Yeah, but class, class is, yeah, it's just, it's actually a lot more complicated than function, unfortunately, and so, but it's fun. It was really fun to implement. And actually, I've, I've done it like four times now, um, trying to get it right. Any, uh, the ultimate, I mean, it's one of these weird things. I, I think it's a kind of a, for template metaprogramming, um, I feel like one of the original uses of template metaprogramming, it was actually to sort of, uh, People, they wrote this domain-specific language inside of templates for generating inline functions. It's like the most insane thing. Um, but like, uh, there's just, I don't know, someone wanted to have super optimized, like, you know, inline ways of writing one plus i times four or whatever. And so I feel like somehow there's some weird legacy where template metaprogramming is kind of called metaprogramming because of that. Because like metaprogramming in general, it's like reflection. Like that's that's the way I see it. It's like code that is kind of using the structure of code that knows about the structure of code to to write new algorithms, you know, or can somehow modify the structure of code. Um, like I think the word, well, I know small talk sort of started this whole meta class, meta, 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 meta. Uh, small talk was really into that. Um, and uh, yeah, um, in Smalltalk, uh, just naturally the compiler, if, if you create a class, uh, the compiler automatically creates the meta class for you. you know? And so really all, this, this, uh, all these contortions I, I've been going through in this talk here are just to sort of emulate what they were doing back in 1971, really old <laughs> language. Um, but yeah, I mean, to me, the, the real, like, the cool part about metaprogramming is when you are taking uh, when you're using information about the structure of your code to write really high-level algorithms to let you remove tons and tons of boilerplate. So that's, yeah, that's sort of... Oh, yeah, I don't know how... <laughs> well, so you guys like to memorize uh, strings of random digits, right? <laughs> um, so... Yeah, okay guys, so on my server, this is running, you know, this runs the GCC compiler, so be gentle with what you type in, please. No <laughs> system delete C colon backslash. <laughs> Joke's on you, it's Linux, haha, <laughs> it wouldn't work. I haven't actually updated, this is a slightly older version of the talk online if you like were to check right now, but when I get home, I'm going to update um, to the latest version. How do you navigate the You've never used Pmax 3 before? No. <laughs> um, I mean, this, uh, that's embarrassing. I don't want to show you. <laughs> it's magic. Don't worry. Don't worry about it. Uh, I, can, I mean, they're just a backwards and forward button, so I can just go you know, and it, and it runs a little bit of script that'll type code or compile or save to a file or whatever. 
Um, that's how, how the system works. Any of you guys use Node.js at all? No? It's, it's pretty cool. You could look it up. It's a JavaScript server system. Um, any other questions? Oh yeah, well, uh, so for reflection in general, I'm not sure, small talk I guess, but um, uh, there's a really just mind expanding and totally point, like not pointless, like dangerous. You should never use the code in this book, but uh, <laughs> it's awesome. It's an awesome book. It's called um, Modern C++ Design by Andre Alexandrescu. Um, silly title because it's not Modern C++ Design, but it's yeah, just he does crazy things with templates, and actually, you know, a lot of the stuff. Actually, I didn't show you too much template meta program, but some of the stuff I showed you was uh, inspired by that book, and it's great. It's really fun to read. Some bedtime reading. Yeah, was that? Any other questions? Oh, I guess you should point out um, one of the common things uh, with templates. One of the common concerns is uh, code bloat, and compiler. Um, you know, it takes a long time to compile, and. Uh, I think Microsoft Visual Studio is actually pretty good. I'm, I'm under the impression that it can do some smart things with templates. Uh, GCC for PS3 is not so smart. Um, and uh, so it is, it is a real truth that templates can be very dangerous. And so it's really important to try to minimize the use. And so for this system, the emphasis is on using templates purely to extract information about types and things to sort of extract structural information and then keep as much code as possible in just normal runtime functions. Because if you don't do that, you can get megabytes and megabytes of code. Um, so yeah, anyway. It, anything else? Ken, do you, you're. I'm looking at my watch, I'm sorry. Bobby. That's fine, yeah, I think. There's another talk at two o'clock and I know a whole bunch of people. Are... Okay, yeah. well, yeah, I should probably close up shop here. All right then, well yeah, thanks for uh, listening guys. Oh,